Our next speakers, Nate Ashenbach and David Arditi, are co-founders of Game Start School. Please give them a warm welcome. All right. We'd like to start with an activity. I want you to think back to your favorite class growing up. Just think on it for a second. All right, you got it? Nathan, tell us yours. So for me, it was when I was in second grade, and uh, I had a chance to create a series of comic books outlining different historical events. Now, my guess is yours is something similar to that, in that you're thinking of an event that you did and not just the things you learned about it. Yeah, for me, it was all about collaborating with my classmates, seeing the different comics side by side, and drawing relationships between them. It was really simple, but it was powerful for me. And teachers all know how this works. They all want to be that teacher, the one creating the powerful, formative, memorable experiences for their students. They all know that if you're not the one doing, you're not the one learning. We want them doing. So for the past year, we've been using these principles to get kids hooked on computer programming and digital design. My background is in software engineering. And I'm a teacher. And together, we've been turning consumers into creators in a gamified classroom. And we believe that making creators takes a skill known as self-direction. And helping to foster self-direction, we found the best tool for that, is play. Kids spend hours in self-direction when they're at play. They come up with new rules, create new realities, they reinvent their identities. And we encourage this at a younger age. But as they start to grow up, we say, sit down, memorize this jargon that we've deemed important for you. We start drawing a line between learning and playing for them. Eli Nyberger over at the Ann Arbor District Library puts it like this that humans are the only creatures that draw a distinction between learning and play. We believe that that's a toxic distinction to make. It's ridiculous to think that if you're having fun, you must not be learning. Right. Now, these standards can be hard. It's hard to standardize this sort of curriculum. The standards are in place to make sure that students are learning adequately at appropriate age levels. Uh, a little more than that, even, to hold teachers accountable for what they're teaching instead of, instead of helping craft a good learning environment for their students. So if play is to be a useful tool in the classroom, it needs to be uh, guided. There needs to be a sense of direction. We need to be intentional with it so that kids everywhere are challenged appropriately. Kind of like a game, right? Yeah. So uh, one of the really important things about games is that it gives kids a chance to uh, explore new possibilities, discover new patterns, all without the fear of failure. In fact, Failure can often be more interesting than success in games. So if it explodes for them, make sure it explodes spectacularly. <laughs> We've had kids fail so hard in our class that they crashed their own computers. But what do you think they did next? Laughed or cried? They thought it was hilarious. It started a trend in the classroom of kids trying to break the computers. They learned a lot about the machines in the process. And it's this sort of playful experimentation that allows kids to learn to think instead of just learning to record. Now, we keep telling ourselves that a kid's intelligence is the accumulated knowledge they've heard over their lifetime. But why should that be true? All standardized tests are kind of based on that. And even if we could get consensus on a set of uh, ideas that we wanted to impart to our kids, it's impossible to know which of those ideas are actually going to be relevant by the time the kids grow up. The computer programming that I do today is wildly different than the programming that my dad used to do. And it's going to be wildly different from what they do if they enter the professional world later on in their life. If we want them to surprise us, which I'm pretty sure we do, we need to give them a sandbox that's bigger than we can actually map. Now, for teachers, that can be kind of a scary thing. And teaching new technologies is intimidating for teachers and students, right? So um, we need to uh, be careful not to dumb it down. It's really important that we let the kids explore this stuff and not hide any of the complexity, because when you start hiding the complexity, you start to rob them of the chance to surprise you. For instance, a sixth grader wrote all of that code. Programmers will recognize for loops, function definitions, variables, and that's exactly what this stuff is. But in our classroom, we talk about this as if it's a magical spell. The kids become Harry Potter. And then they use this spell to decimate each other in combat. But the stunning part <laughs> is that they'll interrupt lunch. Which is usually just... a time that they get to get away from work. Exactly just to ask us about the code. Now think about that. We don't offer any grades for our topic. They're doing this because it benefits them in a game. So we mold the curriculum to their interests, right? By making the content relevant, we allow the kids to see the whole world through the lens of their passions. This is really important when you start to think about a continuum that exists between creators and consumers. And this is a distinction that's important to us. 
that of consumers versus creators. If you want to think about if you learn how to read but not how to write, how damning would that be? That's the case that we have with digital literacy nowadays. We're teaching how to see it but not how to use it. We want to teach the way we'd want to be taught. Make it fun. It should be. Yeah, furthermore, uh, learning through play uh, inspires creators as opposed to consumers. We think that this is important not only for the students, but for the digital and the physical communities that we're a part of. So let them play.